I want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 p.m., so we will begin our presentation shortly. Today on Friday, May 18th, we will have our presentation on using GIS slash geodesign for farmland preservation, given by Doug Miskoviak and Wade Thompson. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we will be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of the sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible. And as you can see, we have quite a few webcasts planned for the next few months. To register for these upcoming webcasts, please go to www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts and register for your webcast of choice. We're also offering some distance education webcasts to help you get your ethics or law credits. These webcasts are available to view at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast-archive. And to log your distance education CM credits, you can follow the instructions listed at the top of the page. You can also follow us on Twitter at Planning Webcast or like us on Facebook Planning Webcast Series to receive up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series sponsored by chapters, divisions, and universities. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, May 18th, and then select today's webcast, which is using GIS slash geodesign for farmland preservation. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. We're also recording today's webcast, and it will be available along with a, six, uh, with a PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast-archive. And at this time, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, who will be Linda Stoll, and she will introduce our, our presenters for today. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, this afternoon, we're going to um, hear a presentation on geodesign and how that can be used by far for farmland presentation. Our first speaker this afternoon is Doug Miskoyak. He is the GIS Education Specialist at UW-Stevens Point GIS Center, and he is responsible for teaching GIS classes and designing and executing the GIS certificate and training programs. Doug has worked throughout Wisconsin applying GIS methodologies for innovative decision making, public participation, plan development, plan Im implementation, and plan monitoring. And then after Doug is um, done speaking, we're going to hear from Wade Thompson. Wade is, uh, works for Rock County, and he uh, has also worked for as a state park planner for the state of Washington. And he uh, now will take a planning position with the city of Fitchburg, which is a city of 25,000 um, near the city of Madison. And Rock County offers unique planning challenges as it contains some of the most productive agricultural land in the state of Wisconsin, yet also ranks as one of the top counties in the state in terms of population containing over 150,000 residents in two major cities. So with that, I want to turn it over to Doug, and he will begin the presentation on using geodesign. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction. Thanks, Brittany, for uh, providing the opportunity for the GIS Center to present on this topic. It's a topic that I have a long-standing interest in and have been working on uh, farmland preservation using GIS and geodesign really since the late 1990s, starting at UW-Madison, working in Dane County. So in today's presentation, I'll share my experiences using GIS and geodesign concepts in uh, places throughout Wisconsin, whether uh, rural but urbanizing or uh, to the ultra-rural using uh, GIS technologies. Let me begin by talking about the concepts of geodesign. This is, I don't know if it's really that new of a, a term, but it's a term that ESRI, the maker of GIS software, is really um, bringing to bear on what they're doing um, at ESRI uh, with ArcGIS and their tools. Geodesign is not a new concept, really. It's planning or designing in geographic space. And it's concepts that uh, planners, whether urban and rural planners, have been doing for quite a long time. Uh, what's new about it is 
uh, the bringing to bear of GIS tools to integrate science-based and information to the decision-making process, uh, especially uh, data that relates spatially. And taking value-based information and citizen participation to take what community members and citizens find important, what they value about their communities, and compare what they value with the science that the, that the data is showing on the ground or on the landscape. And then trying to see if, if what communities value and are, that are articulated through their goals and objectives actually makes sense with what the data is showing them. For example, uh, a community may have goals and objectives that say they want to uh, both protect farmland as well as promote low density development. And with the use of geographic information systems and geodesign concepts, we can run different alternatives and see if, uh, if, if that makes sense, if that's even possible to protect uh, farmland while uh, adding 5,000 new citizens over the next 20 years with low density scenarios. But these geodesign tools are really good at providing real-time feedback to understand the consequences of decisions before they're actually implemented uh, into ordinances onto the landscape. I'm not going to talk exclusively about geodesign concepts today, but if there's folks that are more interested in geodesign as it applies to farmland preservation or other community planning issues, uh, colleagues of mine and myself have published a book through the Esri Press called Citizen Planners Shaping Communities with Spatial Tools, and it's it's available as an e-book, it's an e-pub, and uh, it's mostly to keep the prices low, but it's available at Kobo.com. Several chapters on using GIS and geodesign concepts to help communities throughout Wisconsin really plan for the comprehensive land use planning process, farmland preservation, and environmental and natural resources planning. Uh, Esri also has publications available. Shannon McElvany from Esri has a new book on geodesign coming out this summer. The ARC User Magazine, the Spring 2012 issue, and the ARC News Summer issue both we'll talk about uh, geodesign uh, quite a bit. So if you want to learn more about geodesign, those are very good resources to do so. Today I'll be talking about GIS and geodesign concepts exclusively for farmland preservation, planning, and policy making. And what I'd like to focus on is these four bullet points and how I've used or how I've seen uh, GIS and geodesign um, have an important role in farmland preservation planning, whether it's to analyze important patterns and trends. Uh, number two is really exclusively for geodesign, to prioritize farmland protection alternatives and scenarios. But then once programs are actually implemented on the landscape, to then monitor program successes and or failures. See, should we be modifying our policies based on what we're finding on the ground today? And then finally, how I've been using the technologies to engage and empower the uh, public and citizens in the process so that they actually become um, the decision makers. Let me provide a little bit of context to this work. Uh, in Wisconsin, we passed what's called the Working Lands Initiative um, several years ago prior to, well, in 2009 as part of our biennial budget bill. But this was a process that was running uh, many years prior with our uh, past Agricultural Secretary Rod, uh, Rod Mills is doing. It was an update to our 30 plus year old farmland preservation law to expand and simplify tax credits for farmers, uh, provide local planning grants or funding to local communities that wanted to participate in farmland preservation planning. Uh, as part of the new program with the Wisconsin Working Lands Initiative, they finally added an agricultural conservation easement program for Wisconsin, something that we haven't had before in Wisconsin, and then other measures for soil and water conservation. Now, there's a quite a bit more information about the Wisconsin Working Lands Initiative, uh, the amounts of, for tax credits. I can address some of the questions, but if you're really interested in learning more about how this law was passed and what's included in this law, I urge you to take a look at the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumers website at this web address. Uh, DATCAP really does a good job of providing information about um, the law itself and the criteria associated with the law and for the selection of ag enterprise areas, program and ag conservation easements, and other such programs. 
Let me talk about why utilizing geographic information systems and geodesign concepts were important, as, at least as it related to my research, and why we might be using these today. Um, I've been utilizing these since the late 1990s, and even since that time, um, working with communities, whether it's in Dane County, a very uh, urban community with lots of data resources, and even in some of our more rural communities like Wapaka County, Calumet County, and even all the way up into the Northwoods, we've never found an instance where we couldn't address a question that a local planning commission asked us to address utilizing GIS and geodesign concepts. The technology, the GIS technology that we're, we were using, ESRI products, non-ESRI products, were sufficiently mature and robust to take the questions that citizens were ask, asking us and actually address their questions in real time at the town hall meeting. So the technology was, was sufficiently mature to be very useful in a real time setting. And in Wisconsin, and I'm sure this is true in many other places as well, is that our investments in land records or GIS data was also sufficiently mature and robust to address their questions. Very rarely did I have to create a new data set from scratch to address the questions that were asked of me at the town hall meetings. And the last bullet, the tasks that we're dealing with, whether it's for comprehensive land use planning or farmland preservation, is really an inherently spatial task in which GIS and geodesign concepts work really well. So let me go back to my four bullets and start to address those. Uh, the first, to use GIS geographic information systems to analyze important patterns and trends to bring those to bear not only to educate our policymakers and our citizens, but then to understand how we might uh, develop policies that are related and actually work for our communities based on what the patterns and trends of the landscape are telling us. Now again, I talked about farmland preservation being very spatial. The Wisconsin Working Lands Initiative, the WLI provisions, are also inherently spatial. The law actually talks about the delineation of geographic areas. Whether they're ag enterprise areas, those areas in which communities want to see the ag economy grow and expand, uh, whether it's a farmland preservation zoning district where farmers are eligible for tax credits, or the program on ag conservation easements eligibility. The, um, the criteria for PACE eligibility are all very spatial in nature, and all can be mapped with geographic information systems that we have today and the data sets that we have today in Wisconsin. So the characteristics are really spatial. Soil productivity, soils happen somewhere. Land uses occur someplace. Agricultural productivity, proximity to urban areas. If you take a look at the Working Lands Initiative law, you'd be hard pressed not to find criteria that weren't related to a geographic place. Working Lands Initiative actually, uh, promotes better planning within the law. It talks about the farmland preservation plans requiring the delineation of farmland preservation areas. And to do that, it requires factual information about patterns and trends that uh, we have data for and we can utilize the technology to map. Current land uses, land use trends, demographic trends over time, how we expect our communities to change. Uh, there's a lot in there about soil and water resources and about mapping key agricultural infrastructure. We can do a, quite a bit of that with uh, the data sets that exist and in some regard like the key agricultural infrastructure. We might have spreadsheets that are available that talk about what resources exist and we can take those addresses and then geocode them into a database that we can then use to analyze the landscape even further in a spatial sort of way using maps. Even community articulated value statements, the community's goals and objectives about what they want to see in, their, in the future for agricultural development. We can use GIS and process that information. We can actually create uh, even spatial surveys where communities want to show where they want agriculture to grow or where they want development to occur, and then use GIS in an alternative building, essentially a what-if scenario building session, to see if the goals and objectives fit with what the data are telling us about a landscape. So I can share a story about this from Dane County. I, I was still an undergraduate and had oh, quite a bit of hair when I did this analysis. It was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Land Information and Computer Graphics Facility. 
And Dane County is one of our more urban counties. It's the seat of our uh, state government. It's the seat of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, our largest university. And it's a very urban and rapidly urbanizing place. So when most people think of Dane County, the last thing that comes to mind for them is agriculture and agricultural resources. It's usually Madison and the uh, industrial and commercial resources that exist there. But if you start taking a look at the analyses, and I have to apologize, these are maps that I created as a student, so they're definitely not as good as they could be. <laughs> but this is uh, Dane County as it existed in 1993. So these are older maps, so you'd expect to see a quite a bit more red on this map. But you see some distinct patterns emerging, and they emerge along that magenta line that occurs right well, almost in the middle of Dane County. And we see uh, west of that line a much more forested landscape with uh, smaller uh, packets of agriculture for row crops and forage crops. And then east of that line, obviously, we see Madison right in the middle. Capital is right between Lake Mendota and Monona. But we see a, a landscape that's much more dedicated to agriculture and row crops, at least seen from satellite. If we take a look at the soil patterns, we see that same pattern emerge along this green line this time, where we have much higher quality soils in eastern Dane County and much lower quality soils in western Dane County. And if we would take these two data sets alone, it might say, well, if we're going to protect agriculture here, if we're going to develop policies here in Dane County, we might be focusing on these areas in the east based on these types of patterns. Uh, this map shows why that pattern actually exists. Uh, 15 to 18,000 years ago, uh, the last glacial extent stopped right here. This is the end moraine of the glacier, dropping off many of Canada's rich, high-quality uh, glacial soils in eastern Dane County. So we have some really rich glacial soils in the east. And we have the driftless area, Wisconsin's driftless area west of that line. So we see why those landscape, those topographic patterns emerge, and it's due to the glacier. But we also see some of the socioeconomic patterns emerge very close along that same line. And here we have the agricultural five-year census. I believe this is from 1992, not 1997, forgive me. But we see most of Dane County's dairy farms occur in the West. So we can't write a policy that really focuses on those high-quality soils because we might be leaving out very highly productive working lands in western Dane County. And we also can't write off Dane County as really just not an agricultural county or a totally urbanizing commercial industrial county. Uh, based on the 1992 census shown here through 1997, 2002, and again in 2007, Dane County is Wisconsin's number one agricultural producing county for agricultural receipts of products sold. And if we take a look at national indicators, at one time, Dane County was the 25th most agricultural productive county in the state of, uh, in the nation. And most of our legislators would not recognize that. When I presented these patterns in front of legislators, they would have never imagined that Dane County was so important to the state agricultural. So these data sets really make sense for uh, forming uh, policies that actually relate to some sort of reality. Here we can break down that agricultural census even by zip code. Uh, the ag census doesn't make this easy, but it's still possible. Here we see the market of value of corn as grain sold, and we see the influence of those row crops in eastern Dane County. Most of the value for these crops sold are in the east. If we take a look at the dairy products sold, we see much higher numbers. Uh, Dairy products are a very highly valuable crop, and they produce a lot of income for farmers with, uh, that have dairy production. So we see that pattern emerge again. Western Dane County is a much higher uh, dairy producer than Eastern Dane County. So we learned quite a bit with just those little pieces of information that I shared here. Yes, Dane County is rapidly urbanizing but agriculture is definitely economically viable in this urbanizing, rapidly growing place. And success for agriculture is not based on high quality soils alone. So if we really want to develop policies for farmland preservation in this county, we really need to think about two different sets of criteria. One that might focus on animal-based operations and one that might focus on the quality soils in the east. 
So more than one preservation strategy is required, at least for this comment. So the data shared it quite a bit. Now all the data that I showed here is all in the public domain, the five-year agricultural census. We can download those as tables uh, from, from that uh, resource, and we can load them into uh, GIS data maps. The Sergo soils from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, land use data. Uh, mostly I get the land use data from our counties through the parcel data set. Uh, land use is updated by transaction by the tax assessor, so a very good resource to get land use data. Uh, development pressures, agricultural productivity, community assets, public values, all the data sets that you're going to see here were already in the public domain, and I did not need to create them for these analyses, uh, create the data from scratch. In many instances, I had to massage them and manipulate them to do what I uh, to have them do what I wanted them to, but all these data were available and readily accessible. So here's some other data from the Ag Census here from 2007. And we see a pattern emerge for the entire state of Wisconsin, again, uh, largely glacially based. And we see the market value of crops per county, and we see it follow those glacial patterns. We can break a very similar data set down by zip code for the entire state. And we can see Wisconsin's forested economy. We can see agricultural, the agricultural economy in the south. We can see the effect of the, uh, the glacial lake and the sands area being much less valuable for crop lands. Soils in Cross County, very valuable data set for helping to understand what soils are productive and which ones might be more erodible or floodable or prone to flooding. Compatibility with surrounding land uses. Here, uh, citizens in La Crosse were interested in protecting agriculture based on their distances from large rural hamlets. So we identified where those clusters of development occur. There's development in these green areas, but the larger clusters greater than so many acres, in this case clusters greater than 10 acres, were mapped. Here Calumet County took a very different approach to utilizing land use data. They wanted to identify uh, clusters by public land survey section, those clusters that were, um, that were largely agricultural, those showing up in dark brown, those that had a lot of passive land uses, and those that might have more urban influences. So those in dark brown have more ag and less uh, urban uses. So they're more compatible for supporting policies uh, for agricultural development. Future land use policies developed from the comprehensive land use planning process. Uh, the counties that I've worked with uh, spent a lot of time creating uh, comprehensive land use plans, and they wanted to use the policies from that plan to also influence the policies for farmland preservation. So where the policies in the comprehensive plan were supportive of agriculture, those areas we wanted to know where they were. Where towns and villages had policies that weren't supportive of agriculture, we wanted to know where those were as well. Here's a, a map on agricultural productivity measured by the ag improvement values at a particular farmstead. So here we have a farm parcel. So there's many tax parcels involved in each of these um, farmsteads. And it denotes just the amount of ag improvements that are associated with that particular parcel. So if, uh, if we want to protect uh, our investment in the agricultural economy, these might be places that we want to focus on those places that already have very high investments in agricultural productivity. So again, data sets that were available, in, in this case, from the tax assessor's office. This is a neat map that uh, initially wasn't in a geographic information system form, but this was uh, data that showed where public funding was used to promote agricultural stewardship practices, uh, whether it was a water quality stewardship, or a manure digester, or some other type of stewardship practice on the farm. And this is where public dollars were invested. So the folks really wanted to create policies that would help these farms. If they've invested in these areas already, they want to make sure that these areas find success in agriculture. So those investments, in some cases very large investments, um, aren't squandered. 
water quality was an important issue for Calumet County. In this case, uh, Calumet County has a, a karst landscape in which any kind of pollutant on the surface water can work its way to the groundwater very quickly through the karst topography. So within hours or minutes, uh, pollutants from the surface can actually channel their way right directly to the groundwater. And they wanted to identify areas in the county where if they grew at the agricultural economy, it wouldn't have a diverse effect on the groundwater resource. Calumet County also wanted to protect their investments in areas that were already protected for conservation easements. They said, if we're going to invest in new conservation easements, we want them to occur where conservation easements are already in the county. Ironically, they only have one parcel that's protected with PACE, but they want to make sure that they protect this investment. So they want any new conservation easements to come very close to that area. So there can be an agricultural support network. Well, pretty interesting and good policy, I'd say. All right, so enough about analyzing uh, the landscape with patterns and trends. We all know that GIS is very good at doing that. Uh, with geodesign concepts, we can then take those very same data sets in comparison with uh, community goals, objectives, and values and start to prioritize alternative scenarios. Wisconsin, at least in 2009, according to the National Ag Statistics Service, had 78,000 farms and about 15 million acres of farmland. Now, with the Wisconsin Working Lands Initiative, you know, I have asterisks here because recently the law has changed. There's not money available through conversion fees any longer, but there was at the time. The point being that there's going to be limited funds to protect those 15 million acres of farmland. The Ag Enterprise Area Law, where uh, we want to start channeling money and resources to support agricultural growth. Initially, Wisconsin is setting aside 200,000 acres for agricultural enterprise areas and up to 1 million acres when the law is in full effect. So really, if we have 15 million acres of farms, 78,000 farms, and we have an investment ready to support 1 million acres of farms, there's going to be some competition for limited funding. And that's always going to be the case. Everyone on this webcast knows that's the case. There's just lots of competition for limited funding. So in regard to utilizing GIS, we can take a look at these patterns and trends, community goals and objectives, and try to identify agricultural landscapes that make the most sense to utilize those funds, to identify the agricultural lands that meet our goals and objectives, that actually stand a chance to protecting and growing the agricultural economy and do so by using those funds in the best or the best way possible. So we want to prioritize alternatives. A process that creates winners and losers requires very careful consideration. Farmers that are inside these zones are obviously going to have access to tax credits that farmers outside those zones just aren't going to have access to. Some people are going to be very happy with that. Some people are not going to be happy with that. So we need to create a process, a planning process, that is uh, transparent and defensible. We want to bring this science-based information to bear on why we've made our decisions the way we did. Why is this farmer excluded when this farmer is inside the zone? What's the science to support that decision? Also needs to Consider human values and community values, what the community wants to have happen in the future. We need a process that's measurable to see if those community goals and objectives are even possible with what the data are showing us. And then once we take those goals and objectives and value statements and start to develop criteria, that those criteria are more equitable. So we're not making decisions based on who we know, but based on the patterns that we're finding in the landscape and that those patterns in the landscape are relating well to what the community wants to have happen in the future. And by using geographic information systems and geo-design concepts, we can take those alternatives that communities are making, we can take their criteria and show very transparently how those criteria are applied on the landscape. So when a farmer asks, why am I excluded from this zone, we can then defend the answer by pointing back to these data sets. These are the reasons why. And you might disagree with those reasons. You might disagree how those data sets were applied, but at least they weren't applied in a very subjective manner.
they were applied more objectively, perhaps more equitably. So here's a discussion scenario for a landscape. So you can see how complex we can make these scenarios. And in most cases, when the citizens were behind creating these scenarios, they kept it more simple than this uh, graphic portrays. But we can take these data sets and rank and score them based on what it's showing us. On, in this case, a scale of 0 to 100, it could be a 0 of from a, on a scale from 0 to 10, it could be a scale of high, medium, and low. Whatever uh, you think will be trusted in your community is the scale that you should use. If you're comfortable with the 0 to 100 scale, by all means. And then to weight each of these criteria to see how, they're imp how important they are to ranking the final uh, working lands landscape or the farmland preservation alternative. And I'll talk about how Calumet County had done that in the process. So this is a discussion scenario. This isn't a real scenario here, just a dis discussion scenario of what's possible. But you can see it's farm investments, annual sales, best management practices, the amount of acreage. And for some communities, this criteria won't make any sense at all. Um, if we're developing criteria for a dairy landscape, this might make total sense. If we're developing criteria to protect our smaller organic farms, this criteria probably makes no sense whatsoever. So it really has to be tailored to what the goals and objectives are for that local community. And that's the point. So here's the criteria that citizens in Calumet County had delivered. Here we see they wanted to see compatibility with surrounding land uses. They wanted to grow core agricultural lands that had a stand to grow the Calumet County economy. And they wanted to focus on areas that were already heavily agricultural with limited amounts of um, urban um, urbanizing land uses. And those areas in dark brown are those areas that meet that criteria. They score from, on a scale of 0 to 100, they score 85 points to 100 points. So these, based on this one criteria, these would be the best places to protect agriculture based on their goals and objectives. They wanted to make sure that farmland was protected in core areas outside of the urban boundaries. So they created criteria for that as well, and they rated that. So areas that were already urban got zero points. Where the comprehensive plan said they were going to grow in the future, they received 25, 50, maybe even 80 points. Where they were far from these growth areas, areas slotted for new urban growth, they received the highest amount of points as being the most suitable to grow the agricultural landscape. Future land use policies, where policies were supportive of agriculture, they got the full 100 points. Where those policies were not supportive of agriculture or, or definitely pro-growth, they got zero points, or at least a lesser amount of points. Where data suggested that agriculture could protect water quality, or where agriculture did not degrade water quality, those areas got the highest points. Where that was threatened to degrade water quality, those are the areas that got low points. And so on with soils, protecting investments in existing conservation easements. We then also calibrated the model. So we developed model criteria, but we wanted to make sure that it made sense. So we actually randomly selected 17 farms within this particular county, and each of the plan commission members then visited that farm. And they made their own decisions about it separate from the GIS and geodesign solutions. And we wanted to match. Did, did their criteria match what they actually developed in the GIS model? And if it didn't, we wanted to know why. And in some cases, it was because of factor duplication. If we were double counting a factor, uh, for example, let me scroll back here, we were dealing with land uses, and we were perhaps scoring these areas twice. So we could find out if, if, if we were double counting this criteria, if we eliminated it, did it make more sense? Did it make more sense if we put more emphasis on the soils criteria otherwise? And we were able to tweak the model so that it made sense for Calumet County. We removed the factor duplication. We adjusted for inconsistencies. And in this county, they actually wanted to develop one model not only for agricultural productivity, but for forestry productivity. So largely, when we uh, visited the sites, some of these sites scored very high because they were forested. They were high-quality forests. 
but the criteria they selected were specific to agricultural landscapes, not forested. So we knew that if we wanted to do both, two models would have to be created. So two sets of alternatives would have to be created to support the forested landscapes in this county and the productive agricultural landscapes in the county. Then we'd run the scenarios, see based on if we wanted to put more emphasis on high quality soils versus protecting water quality versus looking at the core land use areas that were already agriculturally productive. What would be the alternatives? What are the consequences of our decisions? And in this case, the consequences show how many acres would be in the high quality zones, but we could see how it might compete with urbanizing land uses where the most conflicts would occur. We could run various alternative scenarios and find out what the consequences were from running uh, running a different alternative. So let me just share with you some of the comments from the citizens that participated in this process. We had, I think, about 10 to 12 people from the county participate were organic farmers, there were large farmers, uh, town board members, uh, a village board member, or folks from around the county that participated in uh, creating these scenarios with GIS. And most of them were also involved in a previous process in the, in the very same county with their comprehensive land use process in which they didn't have uh, full access to the GIS to make their decisions. And the process to them was more methodical and organized. It was less emotional because they were arguing to the data sets and not arguing on something they really didn't have information about. They could take some of the emotion out of the process. They could argue on the data and compare the data to what the community goals and objectives are and really provide information um, in a way that people could understand. I'm a visual person. This process provided information and decision results visually. They really liked the idea of having maps to show what the impacts on the landscape would be. They needed to see how, how that landscape was affected. And having written goals and objectives and written policies just wasn't enough to see what the consequences were. Uh, the person from the village actually had um, something good to say about the validation model. The process to check up and validate the model with field results was great. Um, he was concerned in the comprehensive land use process that really didn't rely on GIS data to make the decisions, didn't create geodesign alternatives, but th that they didn't really know about the county before making policies about it. And this process that showed them the impacts of policies on the landscape before they actually occurred was really important to him. Uh, here's criteria. So what you've seen previously was criteria that was developed at the local level. This here is criteria in table format from our Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection, where they have statewide criteria for selecting parcels that should be suitable for the program and agricultural conservation easements. So I could be running, anybody could be running this process for the entire state of Wisconsin at the parcel level based on the data here. All these data that they're looking at, agricultural capacity, productivity, consistency, development pressure, so on, all these can be mapped with geographic information systems. Let me talk about monitoring the investment. GIS to document what's productive and where. Uh, really, we want to know what the impact of these policies are. Is our investment in purchasing agricultural easements or providing farmers uh, tax credits paying dividends in actually protecting farmlands? Now, the state has actually stepped up their efforts here. Every time a uh, community, a county, or a township actually has a farmland preservation area, an enterprise area, a zone, or PACE, they need to share those GIS data sets with the department, whether it's in shapefile, geodatabase, or an equivalent format. Easements are recorded with the Register of Deeds, and then the Department of Revenue processes this information as well, so that when a farmer applies for a tax credit, um, the Department of Revenue knows that they're actually inside of a zone or outside of a zone. They're verifying their eligibility for tax credits with the GIS database. Uh, local governments can compare land use change over time to see within their ag enterprise areas if, um, if it's protecting farmland like it's 
uh, it was meant to, or if growth is continuing there. The alternative in when I was working with the town of Verona in 1999, this was a question our citizens had. They wanted to know, based on the agricultural exclusive zoning laws, how much land was still available for future development. And these data sets were not recorded. This data was not recorded. We could not address that. So farmers were taking their tax credits, and they may have been taking more tax credits than they were due, getting paid for them without any consequence. With GIS, we can record this and know for sure who's taken uh, the tax credits they deserve and who's converted their land out of agriculture. We can measure that very specifically and accurately. Finally, I'll talk about engaging the public, uh, utilizing geographic information systems, and to a certain extent, I've already done that. Uh, the Farmland Preservation Planning Law has the same requirements as our law in Wisconsin for uh, the comprehensive plans. And that's, at a minimum, they need to have a plan for public participation. How do they plan to engage the public? And at a minimum, they need to have a public hearing. But most communities are going beyond that. In my process, citizens were engaged as the decision makers. It wasn't a planner coming up with a scenario for their communities. I understood that they knew their communities better than I did. So they were in charge of uh, creating the decision-making criteria. I was in charge of helping them understand what that criteria meant. And in most cases, they were very good at interpreting those maps. They could understand how their decisions affected the final landscape. So the citizens had uh, a stake in the process. They made sure the data were accurate. They made sure that their decision criteria reflected their goals and objectives. And in the end, this group of citizens that participated became then advocates of the eventual policies. Transparency. Um, people need to know if they're inside of a zone or outside of a zone and then why. Uh, with GIS, we can create web tools like the one I'll show you here in which here's Calumet County and we can have citizens select this widget tool, select their parcel, and if there's a zone around this area here, they can click on that. They can understand why they might be inside of a zone or outside of a zone. So here, this parcel has 77% of the parcel is considered prime farmland. 0% is not considered not prime farmland, and so on. We could be doing this with all the criteria, whether it's distance to urban areas, uh, how it affects groundwater quality, other types of information associated with the parcel. So we can be providing tools very similar to this. Uh, our state ag trade and consumer protection department also has a tool in which you can identify what areas are protected and which ones aren't. So here's an agricultural enterprise area in our uh, county, Langley County. And then you can go to more information to figure out why this area was selected, why it was included. So some very unique tools to make the process very transparent, to get our citizens access to information. Uh, that's where I'll stop. I just want to talk about this workshop. If um, anybody that's registered for this webinar, give 50% off for this workshop that actually shows the hands-on techniques for using GIS and geodesign um, to accomplish farmland preservation planning. It's an online, self-paced course, and um, if you don't have the tools available to you, we're offering the tools via remote desktop. So we have all the data sets, the tools needed to take this course. Um, if you have any questions about registering, feel free to email me. Again, I'll give you 50% off for being a participant of this webinar. Uh, Linda, I'm going to leave my screen on for a minute. Do we want to take questions now, or should we um, move to Wade? I think we should go ahead. Let's do Wade, and then we'll take questions for everybody at the end. All right, very good. I'll hand off my screen uh, to Wade Thompson. Okay, thank you, Doug, Lynn, and Brittany. Hopefully people can see my screen. Is that? You're good. Okay. 
Uh, as Doug mentioned and Linda mentioned, my name is Wade Thompson. I'm uh, uh, currently a, I take a, uh, took a new position with the city of Fitchburg. Uh, prior to that, I was a planner with Rock County um, in southern Wisconsin. And today, I'm going to talk a bit about Rock County's experience using GIS and geo design for farmland preservation. I want to start off by giving kind of a profile of Rock County, kind of give you some background information. Then we'll talk about a, sp a specific farmland preservation tool that Rock County developed. Um, Doug touched on it, our, our PACE program. PACE stands for Purchase of Agricultural Conservation Easements. And then we'll talk about GIS and GeoDesign's role in developing that program. Uh, then we'll talk about some keys to success, some lessons that Rock County learned in developing this, this program and using GIS. We'll talk about some future directions. Then, of course, we'll open it up for uh, questions and comments. So as planners, we all like to know where in the world we're at. Um, and Doug obviously started the conversation with some context about Wisconsin. Uh, Rock County specifically is in south central Wisconsin. You see the yellow circle there. Rock County is the black dot um, inside the yellow circle. Um, we are pretty close to a lot of major metropolitan areas. Uh, Doug mentioned Dane County, City of Madison. We're just south of that. Um, Rockford, Illinois is, is to our um, to our south as well. Uh, city of Milwaukee is to our east, and Chicago is just to our um, southeast as well. Uh, that being said, we're a fairly sizable population um, ourselves in our county. Um, we have 160,000 residents, um, two large quote-unquote cities, and when I say large, of course, that's relative. Um, our large cities are the city of Janesville, which you see um, kind of in the middle on the map there. Um, in the city of Beloit, which is just to the south there on the southern end of the county. The city of Janesville is about 65,000 people. Uh, the city of Beloit is about 35,000 people. Additionally, we have seven smaller cities and villages and 20 towns. Now, for those of you not familiar with, with Wisconsin towns, um, basically what we have here is 36 square mile entities, um, remnants of the uh, public land survey system, in which these towns actually have their own government. So what I did was highlight one of our towns, um, the town of Porter, in red there, so to kind of give you a sense of, of what those um, geographical government units look like. So again, we have 20 towns to deal with, um, seven smaller cities and villages, and then um, two larger cities. So um, I guess what I'm getting at here is there is a fair amount of um, development pressure given our population, um, given the proximity to other metro areas that we are um, exposed to in Rock County. Um, and that being said, we do have some real good agricultural land as well that we'll talk about in a bit. So again, our, our um, issue is trying to balance um, responsible growth and development with preservation of agricultural lands. So agriculture is a pretty big deal in Rock County. Um, I just put up some number here to kind of give you an idea of, of what we're talking about in terms of, of agricultural impact in Rock County. Uh, agriculture accounts for a little over a billion dollars of activity, economic activity in our county. It employs a substantial amount of our residents. Um, 8,500 county residents are involved in agriculture. And it contributes quite a bit of money as well um, to our total income. Just to give you some idea of what we're talking about when we talk about Rock County agriculture, we're talking predominantly corn and soybeans. Now, Rock County is not um, particularly large geographically in terms of size, um, but yet we nearly always rank near the top in terms of, of our counties, um, in terms of our acres harvested both for, for corn and soybeans. Uh, if you look at the column on the right there, in 2007, out of 72 counties, we were second um, in acres harvested for both corn and soybeans. So again, those are our predominant agricultural crops um, in Rock County. Now next, moving on to kind of some um, population um, growth dynamics. We're, we're certainly not growing exponentially. Um, but we are seeing growth. Rock County is a growth community. Um, given our proximity to a lot of the, the metro areas I talked about, uh, we certainly are experiencing growth. And we do have a fairly large industrial base um, in our larger cities as well. So we do expect growth over the next 20 years. Um, our county agency did some, some projections and projected um, approximately 17,000 new residents um, over the next 20 years. Uh, similarly, we're looking at you know um, housing units being added as well, probably in the range of, of 10,000 over the next 20 years. So kind of summing that all up, I think it's become apparent that agriculture certainly is vital to our county's economy, 
our quality of life and our identity. Um, I think it goes without saying that agriculture requires uh, productive agricultural lands. Um, as we just talked about, Rock County certainly is, is growing. We are experiencing uh, growth and development. So our task at, at the county level was is try to, to try to balance responsible growth uh, with farm and preservation to make sure our county re remains vibrant, dynamic, and stable. So we think our, our farm and preservation tools in Rock County will really help us do that. Those tools will encourage that balance that we talked about and ensure that our productive agricultural lands uh, will remain in our county. So with a little background um, taken care of, I now want to talk about a specific tool that we developed in Rock County and the role of, of GIS and geodesign in, in developing that program. And the program we're going to look at is our PACE program. Again, PACE stands for Purchase of Agricultural Conservation Easements. So I want to talk about three main steps in, in program development, and they directly relate to, to Doug's you know, um, introduction of, of how we can use GIS geodesign in creating really good planning products that ultimately will help us protect um, farmland in our, our geographic areas. Um, the first idea I want to touch on is looking at eligibility criteria um, to get into our program. Uh, the second component is looking at what's called a, a LISA system. Uh, Doug touched on some of the, the major components of, of that kind of a system. Again, LISA stands for Land Evaluation and Site Assessment. And they'll move on and talk about um, what are called program target acquisition areas. So our first step in, in developing our program, and again, I want to back up. I didn't make mention of it in the, the program development process, but our first step was to develop an ad hoc committee. And Doug talked about citizen involvement, and that was really the key in developing a, a successful program. And actually what we did is invite pretty much anyone in the county that had an interest or a, um, um, a, would be affected by developing development of this program. Now that included people in, in cities and villages that traditionally were a little skeptical of, of farmland preservation. They didn't see how it related to their urban areas. Um, they actually viewed this program as a threat because when we're talking about conservation easements, we're talking about lands being permanently re restricted from development. So we felt to make this a county program, um, in the truest sense, we needed buy-in from all players in the county. So again, our first step, before I get into the technical GIS aspects, was to get a really solid committee that represented everybody, um, again, with an interest in this program. So after that committee was, was formulated, the first issue they were faced with was developing what I'm going to call eligibility criteria. And what the committee was faced with was figuring out, given all these lands in our county, uh, which lands should be eligible for the program. And then after that was determined, the next step was to prioritize these lands. Now again, this is a, a purchase program, so what this means is, at the end of the day, we're going to be you know, paying landowners to acquire conservation easements on their property. So we all know money is tight, money is always tight. So what we were faced with was determining um, or creating a system that really made sure our money was, was spent in the most effective and efficient manner. And to do that, we needed to prioritize our eligible lands. And we did that again through this idea of LISA, or land evaluation and site assessment. But talking a, a bit more detail about this, this first step, this idea of eligibility, uh, just throwing a hypothetical example out there, if we have landowner A and they have 80 acres of land, um, are his or her lands eligible for inclusion in our program? What the committee did was come up with seven eligibility criteria. And I won't get into the detail of, of what those all are. Um, if people are interested in um, eligibility criteria and our, our lease system, I can certainly send you uh, more information um, after, after the seminar. Um, but again, we came up with seven eligibility criteria looking at, at various different characteristics of land that would make, um, make for a good fit for inclusion in our PACE program. Now what you see on this map is uh, basically two colors, a gray and a green. Now the gray are basically lands that are, did not meet our eligibility criteria. The green are lands that, that did meet our eligibility criteria. Um, so again, this was kind of our first foray into using um, GIS and ge geodesign in, in coming up with a, um, a PACE program um, component. So again, this is eligibility. After we figured out which lands are eligible, um, the next major step was to figure out, given all those eligible lands, how do we prioritize? Using our hypothetical example, how do landowner A's lands compare to other eligible lands? 
And again, given this climate of you know, limited funds, limited money being available, we need to make sure that, that the money we had um, would be spent, again, in the most efficient and effective manner. So that really brought us to this idea of, of LISA, which is, um, stands for Land Evaluation and, and Site Assessment. And LISA, LISA, in my mind, really premises on, on three main characteristics. And Doug um, kind of got into these in, in some detail. And what LISA does is it looks at lands and it looks at what characteristics should these lands have for you know, whatever your ultimate goal is. In, a, in our case, it was prioritizing lands for inclusion in our PACE program. The second idea is, is how do we distinguish between lands with similar characteristics? Um, and then finally, it looks at which characteristics are most important. What it does is it bundles those three ideas together, and, and with that you come up with, again, a, a LISA system. So I think a, a pretty good um, synopsis of, of what LISA does is it utilizes a comprehensive objective methodology. And you heard Doug use the term objective, and I think that's a real key uh, to the value of LISA. And what LISA does is it develops a LISA score um, for every eligible parcel we have for, for our program on the map we showed earlier and it evaluates suitability for various uses. Now, for our purposes, various uses means inclusion in our, our Rock County PACE program. So at the end of the day, Lisa answers the question, what lands are suitable and conversely unsuitable for inclusion in our county's PACE program? So where I think kind of the rubber hits the road in terms of, of what Lisa does is it takes all sorts of, of, of vital land use information, puts it all together into you know, a GIS model, and that at the end of the day, um, it provides objectivity and consistency for our, our land use decision makers. So I think that's the real, the real key to what LISA does. And Doug touched on it a little bit as well. Um, a LISA score, which again we'll, we'll talk about in a bit more detail, really consists of, of, of land characteristics. And the LE from the, the acronym LISA um, looks at soil characteristics, talking about soil quality, um, for, for agricultural uses, and the SA looks at other uh, socioeconomic and environmental characteristics that would be conducive um, for a parcel to be included in our program. And again, I don't have all the details of our system, but I will certainly be happy to, to provide that information um, should people want it um, at a later date. So um, again, a LISA score is, is the basis of this, this LISA system. So every parcel that was eligible for our program on that map that we saw earlier was given a LISA score based on the, the LISA system that our, our committee created. And what we did, we did a bit of analysis and we came up with three tiers of LISA scores, a tier one, a tier two, and a tier three. Now we used a LISA score scale of zero to 10. Um, LISA scores, and you can see in front of you there, are, are three tiers. Now our tier one farmland were our, our highest scoring LISA, LISA parcels, um, and then tier two and tier three were we're obviously our lower scoring parcels. So with that in mind, our final product, um, after we ran our LISA analysis, was the map you see in front of you. And that's what we're calling our LISA scores map. And what you see on this map is, I guess, about five different colors. You see the gray that we talked about earlier, that's ineligible parcels. You see orange, which is um, lands that are already protected, whether it be through easements or in public ownership, um, owned by someone like the Nature Conservancy, but basically lands that are already protected. And then you see three shades of green. Um, the light green almost looks like a white. Uh, there's kind of a lime green and then a dark green. Everyone, it seems I think Wade's um, phone connection went out, so let's just give him a minute and uh, for him to get to call back in, and uh, it should only take him just a second.
Brittany, while we're waiting, if anybody has any questions for Doug, um, now would be a good time to post them. Hello? Huh. Wade? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, you're back. <laughs> okay, yeah, it just dropped there. I, I don't know what happened. I apologize. Okay, um, picking off where we left off, I apologize for that. Um, just give me a second here to breeze through. Okay, um, we were talking about, again, kind of our, our LISA score map. Um, some of you may have heard of, of Tom Daniels. Uh, I believe he's now teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, written extensively on, on easement programs, uh, LISA, farm and preservation. And in one of his writings, he states that to be effective and efficient, Farm and preservation must meet the following regional goals, and that is to protect the critical mass of farmland. Now what we did is take that LISA score map and, and kind of analyze it one step further. Um, recognizing uh, Mr. Daniel's statements about critical masses of farmland, we developed a target acquisition areas map. And what this map is, is basically blocks of, of um, tier one, those highest scoring LISA parcels, um, you know, kind of grouped together. So again, you see the gray, um, green, and, and orange, and I, I've explained what those, those are. And then you see some dark colored blocks. Those dark colored blocks are basically those critical mass areas um, of higher um, LISA scoring parcels. And those are the areas, again, that our program, at the end of the day, we are going to focus our easement acquisition efforts on those, those target areas. Um, talking a bit about keys to success and lessons learned, um, and again, I, I've said it a couple times now, Doug, Doug mentioned it as well, but what we really found out um, in, in making this program work was kind of three ideas that jumped out. The idea of being objective, consistent, and inclusive. Uh, starting with inclusiveness, I touched on it a little bit. We really brought everyone to the table at the beginning, even those people that might be a little skeptical of the program because we needed their buy-in uh, to make this thing successful. So that was, inclusive was a key. Um, in terms of objectivity and consistency, I think that's, um, that's displayed through use of our eligibility criteria and our LISA system as well. Um, quite honestly, I don't think if we didn't use LISA and if we didn't use an eligibility criteria, I don't think this program would have been successful. It would have just been um, too much subjectivity. Um, historically in our county, there are some issues between towns and cities and county and cities, so I think the trust wouldn't have been there if we didn't use something objective and consistent like, like this LISA system. Um, and as a result of using the LISA system and our eligibility criteria, our decisions that the committee made were, were data-driven, um, and again, a result of compromise by all our parties that were involved. Um, a few more keys to success. Um, we actually, before we did this big county project, we, we tried the LISA system on a, a smaller town um, and actually helped them you know, kind of use it to to make decisions for their zoning ordinance. So we were able to work out the kinks on a project that was much less, um, I guess, controversial, a smaller project. So again, if people are, are taking something away from today um, and they like the idea that we presented, I would encourage, you know, if you can find kind of a, a trial run, a, a guinea pig to kind of work out the kinks, that, that certainly worked well for Rock County. Um, finally, you know, I think as planners, we all know the, the power of politics. Um, we were lucky in Rock County, we had a, a County Board Supervisor Alan Sweeney, who chaired our, our ad hoc uh, PACE Development Committee. And Al was a tireless uh, proponent and advocate of this program. Um, without his leadership, I really don't think we, we could have made this work. So <clears throat> again, we're um, sometimes, you know, these finding advocates aren't always easy, but if you can find one, that'll certainly make your, your job easier. And then kind of wrapping it up in terms of what LISA does in, in terms of, of adding value, this idea of GIS, geodesign in, in planning. Um, it's objective, you know, it, it's data-driven, it's consistent. Uh, Doug mentioned it, it, it's defensible, it allows you to prioritize. Um, in my mind, it's comprehensive and proactive. It encourages true planning. Um, you know, of all the things I've done in, in my short career, this is certainly the most um, truest planning exercise that I was a part of. And finally, it's adaptable to a community and a program's needs. Again, for people listening out there, if they find something they like in what we presented, this can be adapted to your community. It can be adapted to 
you know, whatever programs you're looking to develop. And actually in Rock County, we've kind of taken a twist. We came up with, with a different, different acronym, um, LUCI, Land Use Suitability Evaluation. And again, it, we kind of made it our own. So I think that's, that's a key as well. Now, in terms of future directions, um, this idea of GIS and geodesign is, is really catching on in Rock County. I mentioned a, a couple towns, um, towns having zoning authority in Rock County. Um, a few towns are actually looking at using this idea to revise and, and update their, their ordinances with the intention of, again, prioritizing um, their best farmland for protection. Um, at the county level, we're looking at using it for our comprehensive agricultural plan that kind of lays out a vision for agriculture um, for Rock County over the next 20 years. So again, I think the idea of GIS, geodesign, and farmland preservation planning, um, starting with our, our PACE program, has really, um, you know, people saw the value of it and it's being applied uh, to some other planning practices as well. So with that, um, I am finished and I will turn it back over to um, Linda. Okay, and now would be the time if anybody has any questions for Doug or Wade, if you could post them in the question box and then we will um, see if uh, we can get your your questions answered. All right, we have questions coming in. Um, for the first question, I have, is the land evaluation and assessment criteria the same as the criteria established by USDA SCS? Doug, do you want to start on that one? Or? Sure. Well, the land evaluation okay. site assessment protocol, I'll call it a protocol, was developed in the late 1970s by the then Soil Conservation Service, now Natural Resources Conservation Service. And it was meant as a way, um, the, the creators of the tool, uh, Coughlin, Pease, um, some other influential folks involved with that, really wanted to provide a way for communities to create uh, a tool that could utilize their own criteria and make it theirs. So I don't think it was ever a way to um, specify a national-based criteria. I'm not sure if that was the way you were taking your question but a way to provide communities another tool to evaluate their own agricultural landscapes based on their own local conditions and their own local goals and objectives. If I could just add to that, yeah, and I really think the value of, of you know, whatever you want to call it, Lisa or Lucy or, you know, whoever it's, it's formulated, it's just, you know, a methodology to, to analyze, you know, lands for various uses. Um, that being said, we did take um, the LE in Lisa, is land evaluation, as we've stated. And we did take soil scores um, developed by the NRCS um, to develop our, our program in Rock County. So we did use some um, NRCS data, um, you know, kind of their template for soil scores um, to develop our program. That being said, um, in the literature that I've read, a community can certainly um, kind of modify soil scores to make them fit their own community dynamic as well. So there is that that option to create kind of a, a flexible soil score, soil scoring system as well for, for each community. Okay, we have another question. Wanting to know if there are any examples of using this sort of system to help a property owner developer figure out how best to design a rural cluster. That is to help figure out where is best to build versus preserve on a parcel specific basis. Um, Doug, you want to go ahead? You know, I think Wapaka County has, uh, Wapaka County is one of our uh, central counties uh, just uh, east here of the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And they've developed a tool, um, not necessarily to show where development will go, but they've done a parcel by parcel approach where they're utilizing a land evaluation and site assessment protocol to score the parcels and then submit the GIS plan to the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection to see if that parcel should be protected. While Packer County was so successful in 2010 with their GIS-based approach, the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection submitted 3,000 acres in Wapaka County for protection based on their GIS maps. 
So the success in that regard is quite powerful. Um, and in this case, it was a partnership between local farmers that were interested in the, the program on ag conservation easements and then contacted the county for the county's support to help them create maps and analyses that would show the value of their landscape um, against the state's criteria for the, the program. Now, your question was in regard to development. There's, um, with the soil and water conservation um, portions of the Wisconsin Working Lands Initiative, a farmer that wants to grow at least animal-based operations has to show that every drop of water that hops on, uh, that lands on the landscape has to stay on that landscape. And they're partnering with counties as well as professional planners to develop plans that show that that will happen uh, with some additional engineering. Again, that doesn't address your question in regard to development. I guess where I'm leading to that is there's, there's nothing to say that that could not happen, that these GIS tools couldn't show the best places where development could occur, whether it's parcel specific or to the township or to the entire county. So yes, that's absolutely possible. And I think that's a, an approach that should be um, pursued. Okay, great. Another, um, someone else asked, what are the criteria policymakers value the most for prioritizing lands for preservation? From your experiences, have you uh, found things that seem to really be the, the key items that sway policymakers? From my experience, it, it's been soil type. Um, and I think that's kind of built into the, a lot of the literature that I've read. But, um, you know, the, the programs that I've developed have been specifically for agriculture. So obviously we're putting a lot of emphasis on, on the quality of the soil. Um, Doug talked about the factors of land that we're evaluating. And then, you know, the next step is actually weighting these factors, meaning which factors are, are most important in developing our, our systems. Um, in my experiences, the, the weights, again, we're talking about adding up all the factor weights to get to, to one. In my experience, the soils have been weighted anywhere from a third to a half of the whole weight. So again, for the, the for what we're using it for in Rock County, um, soil quality has been um, the most important characteristic of land. And that makes sense because, um, again, in Rock County, we've got some very good soils. These programs are, are talking about ag land. So um, again, that's, that's been my experience. Yeah, working with communities across Wisconsin, when there's farmers on the committee, the farmers tell you that these farms are located and find success because of high quality soils. So for most communities, it does begin uh, with soils. Now, let's say, for example, that we're not interested in these core agricultural productive working areas. In Wisconsin, we have a lot of cranberry farms and operations, a lot of orchards. And those operations aren't looking for high quality drained, well drained soils. They're looking for soils that can be flooded. They're looking for very different criteria for the suitability of a landscape for supporting cranberries or orchards or berry farms or cherries. Um, so it, it really depends on what the community is interested in locating. And if they're locating core uh, agricultural working lands for row crops, Soils are going to be one of their number one criteria. And uh, with the communities I've worked with, that's what they were trying to I use the tool for, was to identify those core working lands. But uh, the tool is very flexible. OK. Um, and then we've been asked, did you use, and there's a bunch of alphabet soup here. Um, I don't have this spelled out. S S. U R G O Sergo soils data. Uh, was the question what does that stand for? No, the question is, did you use? Is that the particular data set you use, or do you get your soils data from elsewhere? Oh, I see. Um, yeah, that's the soil survey uh, geographic database. So that's that's the data set that has the highest resolution for more localized planning. It's still at a uh, I think a 1 to 24,000 scale. So you really can't utilize the Sergo soils for site-specific planning to identify where there's high-quality soils on a parcel. 
but it's a very useful data resource to do community and county-wide planning. Um, but yes, I use the Sergo Soils database. Okay. And that's all the questions I currently have, and I guess we'd put a call out again to see if anybody else has questions for either one of our speakers. Um, if not, Brittany, I guess I'm going to turn this back over to you. That seems to be the end of our questions. Okay, well, um, we can go ahead, I guess, and... Uh end the session for today and um, also if anybody thinks up a question that you know they didn't think of during the presentation you can email Doug or Wade and follow up with them and so um, again uh, let's uh, like to thank um, Linda for um, moderating and hosting our session and Wade and Doug for presenting and um, for our attendees, I'm going to go over how to log your scheme credits for attending today's event in just a moment. So um, uh, Doug and Linda and Wade, you guys can go ahead and log off. And thank you again. Brittany, thanks for the opportunity to present. No problem. Thank you. Thanks again. Okay, well, for those of you who are still still with us, um, to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, May 18th, and then select today's webcast, which is using GIS slash geodesign for farmland preservation. And this webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. And then also we are recording today's session, so you will be able to find a recording of the session along with a PDF of the presentations at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive. And this does conclude today's session, and I want to thank everyone again for attending.